It's my now great honor uh, today to welcome Professor Melissa Harrison. Um, the group of uh, Professor Harrison has been investigating how pioneer factors regulate transcription initiation with a particular focus on early embryogenesis and activation of the delivery genome, making incredible contribution to the field. Um, she has received many honors and awards throughout the research career, but also very widely contributed to the community by serving scientific committees and uh, both at the University of Wisconsin Medicine, which she, where she is based, but also in organizing international conferences like the EMBO workshop on the genome activation and the annual um, the Social Research Conference just very recently. So we're very happy to host her here. So please join me in giving a uh, warm or by uh, virtual welcome to Professor Harrison to the Fragile Nucleosome uh, series. Thanks so much um, for the kind, in <laughs> kind introduction and also for the invitation to speak in this um, really amazing um, seminar series, which I think is one of the few good things to come out of the pandemic. We were discussing how it had started on um, in April of 2020. So thank you really so much. Um, so what my what the lab is broadly interested in understanding is how do you take these two highly specialized cell types, put them together and get an entirely new organism. And in particular, what we're interested in is how is that single DNA genome that's formed at fertilization differentially interpreted over development to give rise to all the different cell types of the adult organism. And they really don't have to tell this audience, and, and in fact, we already discussed this, that this is largely by the uh, ability of transcription factors to bind sequence specifically to the genome and drive gene expression. But of course, the DNA genome isn't sitting uh, naked in a cell. It's wrapped around uh, histones to form nucleosomes, and these are further compacted to secondary and tertiary structures, which can include transcription factor binding. So really, if we want to understand how this genome is interpreted, we have to understand how chromatin accessibility is modified to influence the binding of these transcription factors. And so a really powerful framework for understanding this is the concept of uh, pioneer factors. And these are specialized transcription factors that have the capacity to bind to their sequence uh, sequences even when they're wrapped up in nucleosomes, and then they can establish accessible chromatin domains and facilitate the binding of additional transcription factors. And we, we know that proteins with these characteristics are really important in driving developmental transitions. And this is highlighted by the fact that three of the four key Yamanaka reprogramming factors that can reprogram a specified cell type to an induced pluripotent cell type have these pioneer factor characteristics. But at the same time, we know that these pioneer factors aren't all powerful. There's limitations to these abilities. And this is highlighted by the fact that, for instance, reprogramming in culture is low efficiency and can take weeks. Furthermore, we know that there are chromatin barriers to the binding of these pioneer factors. For instance, H3K9 trimethylation can inhibit the binding of OX4 and SOX2. And this is really important and reflected in disease as well, because pioneer factors are misexpressed in a large number of cancers, but they're very uh, specific to individual types of cancers highlighted in this sort of complex diagram. So really, if we want to understand how these pioneer factors drive chromatin accessibility to regulate normal development and how misregulation of them leads to disease. And so for that, what my lab studies is conserved developmental transitions. And in particular, one of the developmental transitions we really we focused on is the initial stages of development. So this is a transition that's conserved amongst all metazoans. And initially it's controlled by, development is controlled by maternally deposited products, primarily these maternally deposited RNAs. And it's not until hours or days later that the zygotic genome becomes transcriptionally active. And there's a coordination between the activation of this zygotic transcription and the degradation of these maternal RNAs. And so there's this reworking of the transcriptome of the early embryo during what is termed the maternal to zygotic transition or the MZT. So not only is the transcriptome being reshaped, but also the developmental potential of these um, cells are being reshaped as they move from those two specialized germ cells, the sperm and the egg, to the totipotent cells of the early embryo. And in all organisms studied to date, pioneer factors drive activation of the zygotic genome. And in fact, the first major activator of the zygotic genome was identified in Drosophila by Chris Russell's lab and is a protein called Zelda. And we and others have shown that Zelda has these canonical features of a pioneer factor. 
It can bind to nucleosomal DNA. It can establish accessible chromatin domains. And then likely through the formation of hubs, it can facilitate the binding of additional transcription factors like dorsal, bicoid, and twist. But at the same time, the chromatin structure of the early embryo is unique. So in most externally fertilized organisms, there's incredibly rapid replication cycles. So in Drosophila, these replication cycles are happening every 10 minutes, five minutes to synthesize the DNA and five minutes for mitosis. In addition, there are unique linker histones that are uh, expressed during early embryogenesis and replaced by the canonical H1 as the zygotic genome becomes transcribed. And furthermore, the chromatin is in a relatively naive state. So I'm showing you here for Drosophila, but this is known for other organisms, that there are relatively few chromatin modifications with acetylation uh, be being uh, earlier and then followed by methylation of various histones. So one of the questions we had then was, is this reprogramming by the pioneer factor Zelda unique to this time in development because of this distinctive chromatin state? Or can Zelda act as a pioneer factor to reprogram in other tissues? So we looked at another tissue and we collaborated then with Chang Yu Lee's lab at the University of Michigan to look in the neural stem cells of the larval brain. So this is three days later in development. And these larval stem cells divide asymmetrically to both self-renew and to produce a partially differentiated progeny that can then mature into this intermediate progenitor cell, which is a transit amplifying population. And what we could show was that Zelda was expressed specifically in these neural stem cells and rapidly eliminated in these partially differentiated progeny. So we asked then what happens if we misexpress Zelda in these partially differentiated progeny? And what we found was that it could reprogram these cells back to a stem cell and we could get a sort of tumor-like phenotype in the brain due to these extra neural stem cells. So Zelda can reprogram to an undifferentiated state in another cell type. We then ask what happens if we go further down this differentiation lineage and reprogram um, and express Zelda in the INPs. And we asked whether we could again get extra neural stem cells. And what we found was that that was not the case, that there was some barrier that was being developed as these cells differentiated that now could, kept Zelda from reprogramming these cells. So we, we asked where is Zelda bound in these neural stem cells and could we wanted to compare this to the binding in the embryo. We could perform ChIP-seq on brains enriched for these neural stem cells and identify 12,000 binding sites. And we could overlay that with the ChIP-seq that we, I had performed it as a postdoc in the early embryo. And we identified it 4,000 regions like these that are highlighted that were shared between the larval neural stem cells in the early embryo, just as we'd expect for a pioneer factor that might be agnostic to chromatin environment. But <clears throat> we identified thousands more regions that were unique to each of these different tissue types. And we could confirm that these were unique based on orthogonal antibodies, et cetera. And so um, these data are published. So I'm just summarizing the highlights, which is that what we could show is that these sites that were shared tended to be open and accessible promoters in both tissues, whereas the sites that were uniquely bound by Zelda in either the neural stem cells or the embryo were also uniquely accessible in these tissues and uh, were correlated with enhancers that were tissue specific. So we wanted to ask then at these enhancers, what is happening as the cells differentiate from that neuroblast into the INP? And so here I'm showing you one enhancer that we um, identified for a master regulator of stem cell fate talus. And here is ChIP-seq for Zelda in the neuroblast as compared to the embryo. And we can see these two different enhancers. And when we look at chromatin accessibility, indeed these enhancers are open and accessible in the neural stem cells. So we could use a system developed by uh, the Lee lab in which they could um, sort of synchronously differentiate these um, cell types and we could look at chromatin accessibility. And what we found for TALIS as well as for many of these enhancers is that they became uh, closed as these cells differentiated. And furthermore, we could disrupt chromatin factors like histone deacetylases that limited this closing and likely and allowed Zelda to reprogram more efficiently. So in total, what this story told us then was that pioneer factor binding in the case of Zelda was tissue specific and that there were barriers to the ability of it to bind and reprogram. So another pioneer factor that we study in the lab is a protein called Granihan. 
Uh, it's conserved from fungi to humans. Um, it's involved in driving epithelial cell fate in all this uh, organism studied, and it binds to this conserved DNA sequence. And so when we analyze grainy head binding over development, we can look at multiple stages of embryogenesis in Drosophila. And here I'm just showing you examples, but we saw this genome wide. We saw that once it occupied these binding sites in the early embryo, those binding sites were the same sites that were occupied throughout embryogenesis. And furthermore, even when we looked at tissues from the larva that is like two to three days later, again, it occupies those same binding sites. So this is different than we saw, we had seen for um, Zelda, because here the binding didn't appear to be tissue specific. Uh, Stein Ehrens' lab beautifully showed that grainy head um, in the eye disc was required for chromatin accessibility, with accessibility being lost upon depletion of grainy head in the larval eye disc. And Megan Freund in my lab uh, used in vitro techniques to show that uh, grainy head can actually bind nucleosomal DNA. So grainy head has all these features of a pioneer factor. <clears throat> but it's important in the larva such that if we get rid of, if the Steinerz's lab got rid of grainy head, there was now a loss of inaccessibility. But when we looked in the embryo, we didn't see the same thing. We saw that when we got rid of grainy head, these sites remained accessible. And so what this told us was that pioneer factor activity appeared to be tissue specific. And so now we have these tissue specific binding and tissue specific activity of these pioneer factors. So Tyler Gibson in my lab wanted to investigate what can help modulate this tissue specific activity of these pioneer factors. And for this, he turned to a sort of what we'll call an in vitro system and a cell culture system in which we could exogenously add these proteins back. And so what he did was he used a copper inducible system to express brainy head and Zelda in S2 cells where they're not normally expressed. And then he looked at binding, gene expression and chromatin accessibility. And what he identified was that we could see basically three classes of binding sites. Class one sites that were open and accessible, bound by the uh, transcription factor and remained accessible upon binding. We identified class two binding sites that were inaccessible uh, when this protein was not expressed, but however, the protein could bind to the closed chromatin, but this chromatin did not open upon binding. And finally, class three sites where these proteins were behaving just as we expect for a pioneer factor, binding to closed chromatin and promoting chromatin accessibility. And so when we looked genome-wide for Zelda and grainy head, we could identify uh, the largest class being these class one, these open sites, but we also identified extensive binding to uh, closed chromatin and opening at a subset of these regions. So now we were sort of curious as to whether this was distinctive to these two pioneer-like proteins or whether uh, other proteins might have different binding profiles. And so we turned to a protein that was not expressed in S2 cells, but had characteristics that we knew were different from Zelda and grainy head. And this is a protein called TWIST. So we just heard about TWIST in the prior talk. And um, in, in the early fly embryo, uh, TWIST is, uh, Zelda is a pioneer factor for TWIST. It can promote the binding. And this has been shown by Alex Stark's lab and also more recently by Julia Zeitlinger's lab. So, and furthermore, um, Eileen Furlong's lab showed that twist binding is developmentally regulated over embryogenesis, so that the binding varies. So in these two ways, it's different than both Zelda and grainy head. And so we again expressed it in S2 cells at approximately endogenous levels and identified these three classes of binding sites. And again, we could see extensive binding to this open and accessible chromatin, but we also found very a large amount of binding to closed chromatin but only a small proportion of these became accessible. And so we can see that for the two pioneer factors, grainy head and Zelda, or what have been defined as pioneer factors, we could see a decent proportion of the closed sites that they bind being opened and much less for this uh, factor twist. So now we wanted to dig in a bit more and understand what defines these three classes of binding sites. And so we started looking at these abundant class one open and accessible sites. And so the first thing we did was we looked at how similar are these sites that are bound by Zelda, Grainy Head, and Twist. And we found there's an actually extensive overlap of the binding of these uh, proteins to the same open accessible regions. And furthermore, these are regions that are enriched for active chromatin marks like H3K27 acetylation, the enzyme CBP that deposits this mark, as well as H3K4 trimethylation in his 2AB. 
And when we looked at the motifs that underlay these, we looked for individual motifs for each of these factors. We found that the motifs were actually not particularly enriched in these bound regions as compared to all accessible regions. And so what this really told us was um, that these factors appear to bind opportunistically to this accessible chromatin. So what about these binding to closed chromatin? When we looked at the motif content, and we've done this in um, multiple different ways, um, I'm just showing you actually the, the percentage of motifs here, we could see that the binding, the closed chromatin was enriched for these uh, sequence specific motifs, and those that were open were even more enriched than those that remained inaccessible. And so this really suggests that motif content supports binding and closed chromatin, and even more so uh, supports pioneering um, and opening of the chromatin. So now that we had these sort of self exogenous expression, we could go back and compare it to our in vivo endogenous expression, where we had multiple data sets for these um, different factors in multiple different tissue types. And so here I'm showing you heat maps for Zelda in which we see these class one, two, and three regions. And then we could look at how did these compare to Zelda binding in the embryo or in those neural stem cell populations. And what we could see was that binding in S2 cells looked very different from the embryo, but it also looked quite different from neural stem cells with these large numbers of binding sites that were unique to the in vivo binding, but were not replicated in S2 cells. And again, we could say this, we could see the same thing for grainy head, although um, as we might expect for a protein that binds to a lot of the same regions through development, we saw more similarities here for grainy head. So we started to look at investigate what features might be at these additional regions that where Zelda could bind in vivo or grainy head could bind in vivo, but not um, in S2 cells. And one of the things we noticed was an enrichment for either H3K27 trimethylation um, mediated by PRC2 or H3K9 trimethylation um, a marker of constitutive heterochromatin. And we term these the class four and class five regions. So we know that for our foreign SOX2, the constitutive heterochromatin is a barrier to binding. So we specifically wanted to investigate whether this, um, this PRC2-mediated H3K27 trimethylation was a barrier. And if we got rid of it, could Zelda and Grainy Head now occupy these sites in S2 cells? So we could treat S2 cells with test metastat, which inhibits PRC2, and we could see by ChIP-seq that we lost uh, H3K27 trimethylation. But when we looked at Zelda binding, we now we didn't see any changes in the binding dynamics or binding of Zelda, and we didn't see occupancy of these regions that had now lost H3K27 trimethylation. And we saw the exact same thing when we did this for grainy head. And so what this says is that H3K27 trimethylation itself is not a barrier to binding. So one of the really nice things about S2 cells is people have studied these and characterized their chromatin extensively. And so Tyler went back and looked at these uh, multiple different data sets of active marks, of histones, of, of polycomb, of heterochromatin and insulators at these different classes to look for things that might be enriched. And so we thought maybe there was another chromatin mark that was enriched that was keeping um, these proteins from binding even to these H3K27 trimethylated regions. But when we looked, there really wasn't any chromatin mark that popped out that we thought could be a different um, mark that was keeping these regions repressed. And so another obvious um, potential um, tissue specific phenotype or tissue specific aspect are the cofactors that are expressed. And so what Tyler did was he looked at the motifs that were enriched in each of these classes, and then he could overlay those motifs with the level of expression of the proteins that could bind those motifs. And so we could do this for Zelda, but we could also do this for grainy head and twist. And what he identified was, was that those regions that were bound in S2 cells were enriched for genes that were expressed highly in S2 cells, particularly at these class one genes where we could identify specific factors like DREF and GATA that are highly expressed in S2 cells and might be pro promoting the accessible chromatin these uh, factors are taking advantage of. By contrast, when we looked at the tissue specific binding, those regions that weren't bound in S2 cells, we could see that they um, had much more highly expressed in these tissues as compared to S2 cells. And so what this told us was that it really appears that cofactor specificity may help promote pioneer factor binding in a tissue specific manner. So we want, also wanted to look at other factors that might change in different tissues or in um, um, different uh, 
developmental context or even in disease context. And so for that, we looked at the different levels of gene expression or protein expression. And we could use that by titrating different amounts of copper. And this fits really nicely with the prior talk. And so we looked when we um, expressed increasing amounts of Zelda or grainy head using these copper inducible systems. We looked at both binding and um, attack seek. And I'm just showing you here attack seek chromatin accessibility. And so here's no, uh, no copper induction. And then here's the copper induction levels that we had analyzed previously. And then here's uh, a, a slightly less and slightly more, still in a physiological range. And what we can see for both Zelda, but particularly for grainy head, is that these class two regions, which is bound but closed, we can now see accessibility being established at these higher grainy head comp. Uh, concentrations. And furthermore, we can start to see accessibility at these regions that are bound in vivo, but weren't bound at these lower concentrations. And so a bunch of analysis could really show that we could increase binding and increase accessibility when we increased the amount of protein concentration. We could now go back to our neural stem cell system and test this in vivo. And so when we um, looked at endogenous levels of cell binding, we can identify these endogenous cell binding sites in the neural stem cells. But when we now increase Zelda expression using transgenics, we could then analyze where Zelda was binding and we could identify a number of new Zelda bound regions. And when we looked at what did those regions look like in the neural stem cells in terms of chromatin accessibility, we could see that these were primarily enriched for closed regions. So upon increased cell to expression in neural stem cells, we could now increase cell to binding to these closed um, inaccessible regions. And so finally, we um, to better understand um, how these pioneer factors access their binding sites, we wanted to look at the protein domains that could drive this. And in particular, what we wanted to know whether the DNA binding domains alone were capable of binding and increasing chromatin accessibility. And so for this, we expressed either this cluster of four zinc fingers, which is the Zelda DNA binding domain, or the C-terminal region of grainy head, which includes the conserved DNA binding and dimerization domain. And so here we're just looking at metal plots of these class one, class two, and class three regions. And what we could see is that the Zelda DNA binding domain alone was capable of binding DNA. It could bind to these open accessible regions, but it was not able to bind closed chromatin, suggesting these extensive intrinsically disordered regions or um, other ordered domains outside of this um, cluster of zinc fingers was required for binding to closed chromatin. And similarly, for grainy head, we saw a dramatic decrease in binding to closed chromatin, although we could see some chromatin occupancy. However, for both of these factors, the DNA binding domains alone were incapable of increasing chromatin accessibility. And so this really says that regions outside these DNA binding domains are required for binding uh, well to closed chromatin and absolutely required for driving accessibility. And so in total, what this sort of comparison between what we'll call, you know, exogenous and endogenous expression is telling us is that there is pioneer factors can uh, be regulated at the level of occupancy, but also opening, so binding and activity. And that we think that it really is high chromatin occupancy that is required for chromatin opening. And this high occupancy can be uh, modulated in a number of both protein intrinsic and protein and extrinsic factors. So for instance, motif content, we could see that if there were better and more motifs, this pioneer factor could um, occupy closed chromatin and open that chromatin. Furthermore, um, regions outside of the DNA binding domain are required, and we know this for many transcription factors more re uh, recently, are required for sort of stable genomic occupancy. And in this case, we see then it's needed for binding closed chromatin. But there's also very tissue specific factors like the protein concentration. If we increase expression of these proteins, they could now bind and open new regions of the genome. We also think the cofactor milieu that's expressed in the tissues, we know this for, um, we have hints from our data, but also lots of other pioneer factors can certainly stabilize the interactions of these pioneer factors on the chromatin. And also, while we didn't find this for H3K27 trimethylation, we know from our studies of Zelda in vivo and from lots of studies of other pioneer factors that histone modifications can also be a barrier. And so what this says is to understand how these pioneer factors drive development or drive disease, it's going to be really important not just to overexpress them in tissue culture, but it's important to um, understand their expression levels and the endogenous system. Um, 
set of uh, tissues in which they're expressed. Because of course in cancer, for instance, grainy head is overexpressed in epithelial cancers. And we can't assume that it's binding and doing the same, opening the same regions that it is when it's expressed um, at endogenous levels in an epithelium. And so in total, I think that understanding how these pioneer factor functions are gonna have really important understanding for how differentiation is driven and I um, showed you for grainy head. We know that grainy head like two is really important in um, mammalian differentiation profiles. In reprogramming either in the early embryo as we've shown during the MZT or in culture, for instance, through the um, presence of Yamanaka factors or in trans differentiation. And so hopefully by comparing these um, sort of cell culture based studies to in vivo studies in uh, model systems like Drosophila, we can get a better understanding of how these proteins are driving the interpretation of the genome. And so with that, I'm gonna thank the people who did the work. Um, in large part, this unpublished data that I talked about was performed by Tyler Gibson, who recently graduated from the lab. Our collaborators, our funding sources, and just um, let you know that we're always um, looking for great people to join our group. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you very much, Melissa. Fantastic talk. Um, I think we, we already have a few questions piling in. Uh, I'll probably put a couple of mine in between at some point. Um, so we start with Peter Hard Ederson. Uh, was this fascinating talk, Melissa? Do you think the IDR assists in minding close chromatin through interacting with the core histones or through interacting with proteins that are Ready bound to close chromatin? Um, I, that's a great question and something that we're trying to get at through sort of more in vitro biochemical studies in which we can look at the binding of the different domains. Um, I think it's, you know, we don't know whether it's um, helping interact with the chromatin or whether it's actually um, the DNA or whether it's with the histones. We actually think that there may actually be another DNA binding domain in Zelda itself. And so we're currently working on that as well. Uh, Mateo just messaged, he lost his internet. Mm -hmm. um, but I see Sahin has uh, his hand raised. Maybe you can ask the next question. Uh, great talk, uh, Melissa. I was just curious um, when you were talking about um, motif content being important for pioneering, did you see any evidence um, of like motif positioning with respect to the nucleosome as as you know people have shown for like arc for SOX2 um, yeah. binding? Yeah. So Tyler tried to do that. Um, using a large number of um, Bosman Stiesel's group and others have done like actually single molecule tracking of where nucleosomes are placed um, and looking at MNAs. The problem is most of these are enhancers where the nucleosomes are super well positioned. And so we do show in um, the preprint that we actually couldn't, we didn't find any evidence of sort of a specific position along the nucleosome. Um, we're still investigating that in vitro, but using this in vivo analysis, we, we couldn't see any evidence of that but that's a great question. Okay, thank you very much, sorry for the interruption. Um, the other thing we have a question from Nadia Fursova, who says, great talk again. Okay. I think we lost him again. All right, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. So this is from Nadia, it says, great talk. Uh, do H3K27 trimethylation in rich regions become accessible by, by attack seek or MNA seek upon PRC2 inhibition in S2 cells or stay closed? That's a really good question. I do not, I don't remember, and I'm not positive that we looked at that with attack seek. So that's a really good question and something we could go back and look at. Awesome. And then Hong has a question which says, hi, I was curious if you tried titrating levels of Zelda DNA binding domain. Do you think a high enough concentration would result in the, the DNA, binding, DNA binding domain being enough to bind and or open chromatin? I can tell you that that was a great question by uh, a reviewer of the of the manuscript, and we did those experiments, and we've just gotten the data back, um, so we haven't fully analyzed it, but provisionally we don't see increased opening when we drive more expression. So I think that's a great question and um, something we immediately followed up on, and we don't see that, but um, I I don't want to state it too 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 strongly until we actually finish really analyzing all the data. So that's great. Mateo, are you back now? 
Um, do you have um, I, I, I hope so, but uh, let, let's see how, how this goes. <laughs> um, so um, I think we've gone through the, the question. Do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, ben, I can actually. ask. So actually on the DNA binding domain, um, I was intrigued by your observation that of the opportunistic binding to accessible chromatin. Did yeah. that, um, did you see that with just the DNA binding domains when you expressed it or did it require extra domains as well? Yeah, so we did. So that was the binding that we still saw to those class one sites. And so, um, so we really think that that's sort of, as we said, opportunistic. We don't have any, you know, a lot of people have done some beautiful single molecule work and other work that really shows that regions outside of the DNA binding domain are important for stable binding. Um, you know, we don't have those single molecule studies, but my guess would be is that the binding to open chromatin is, is less stable, um, but still happens without that. Yeah. Great question. And maybe I'll, I'll turn in something a bit more philosophical in a sense. Um, what are your thoughts on the definition of pioneer faction factor at this point? Because it's like it's uh, by definition it should be something that can bind chromatin no matter what. But while you have nicely shown that that actually it's it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray in between there. What, what, what how do you see the the whole story? Yeah, so I mean that's a great question and and sort of a loaded question. I mean I think what's kind of I mean it's why we were really particularly interested in. Zelda in other tissues because of we were wondering whether you know is a pioneer factor a pioneer factor in all tissues and that it's expressed in or was Zelda for instance taking advantage of the really naive chromatin state and really rapid replication cycles and I think we should you know I think the data suggests that it's pioneering activity it still has this ability to find enhancers in other tissues but I think it's muted compared to that and so um you know I guess for me it's a it's why I sort of use it as a useful framework because I'm not sure I think that it's a black and white definition. I think it's, there are, you know, and Julia Zeitlinger has a, a beautiful paper coming out in DevCell where they've basically shown that Zelda is distinctive in the early embryo, um, you know, compared to these other factors in terms of defining chromatin accessibility. But, you know, there's clearly a continuum and certainly twist and twist orthologs, I, I saw Johanna Wasaka give a really nice talk um, at the transcription meeting recently, may have some pioneer factor ability as a master regulator of, of various cell fates. And so I think it's, my feeling is it's probably a, a continuum, but that it's these proteins that act at the top of gene regulatory networks to define enhancers and are more powerful than sort of other factors, but. Yeah, thanks. Probably something, a bit more on, on the same um, line, this two Zelda and Greeny had a partner transcription factor that combined two specific sites. And if so, could this partner-partner interaction influence chromatin opening? And maybe I can add something there also on chromatin remodeler, maybe. Right. So we don't know how Zelda promotes chromatin accessibility. Um, and by we, I mean the field, right? It's a big protein, but you know, certainly my lab has spent a lot of time trying to identify protein cofactors and we're still at it. Um, we do have some evidence that it um, is important for binding of CBP P300, so uh, histone acetyl transferase, um, but we don't know if that's direct or indirect. And it's unclear whether there are specific partners of Zelda or grainy head in terms of physical interactions. Grainy head does interact with chromatin remodelers and, and histone. Um, I think methyl transferases um, in other tissues are in tissues, but it's it's unclear how those influence grainy head occupancy. So we don't really know. That's a good question. And it's sort of what we were trying to start to get at with some of these studies. Yeah. Thanks. And yep. maybe I'll take another quick one. Uh, a bit reversing the, the thing instead of what is uh, what Zelda regulates, what is regulating Zelda? So you, you mentioned that um, in neural uh, neural tissues during the larva, Zelda is re-expressed. Is uh, if you look at what are the regulatory elements that drive the expression of Zelda, either in the neural or in the early embryo slash maternal deposition, and or, or do you know whether there's a small subpopulation that keeps expressing Zelda at low levels? until the neurogenesis. Do we know anything about that? 
I don't. <laughs> um, I don't want to say that we don't, but I don't, right? So Zelda is is expressed in the nurse cells maternally um, and probably maternally deposited in the oocyte. And a lot of the genome actually is deposited in the oocyte. So um, there's not very, too much known about that sort of level of developmental regulation. Um, we do know that it's translationally regulated. And so we look at the the protein brain tumor or BRAT regulates Zelda both in the early embryo and in the neural stem cells. Um, so we know that it's regulated at the translational and transcriptional level, like after transcription or transcript level. What is driving its transcription, we don't know. Chris Russell really nicely showed in her original paper, as well as um, the Stout et al. paper, that it's Zelda is continued to be expressed in the embryonic um, uh, central nervous system. So what can keeps that going? I'm not sure. I know, I know that there was, um, I'm trying to remember a name that I think Cruz lab, but anyways, I'm not sure. Other people might know though. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think great. we are, yep. we are about time, uh, with, um, with the time. So, um, I think if there's no further question, um, we can wrap it up here. So thanks again to both speakers for the fantastic talks and uh, see you all in a couple of weeks for the next session. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you both. Those are great talks.